Hi everyone, welcome to Art of the City TV. Today I'm very excited to bring the beginning of the Native American Heritage Month, Frank Buffalo Hyde, an artist I've been following for a long time. And uh, Frank is very well known in the contemporary art um, community. So I think he is one of those artists that you definitely want to listen to what he has to say because he's talking about some very important things here in Indian country. So let's see if we can get Frank on the line here. Yay! We made it. Hi, Frank. Yes. Hello. How are you? I'm all right. Kind of tired. Yeah, I know you moved, what, a month ago? Yeah, we've been uh, in the process of moving all summer and uh, we finally uh, stopped going back and forth about two months ago. All right. Well, this is pre-recorded, so it'll be really great. And then I can always edit it. So whenever okay. it's live, it's a little bit more like, ah. <laughs> I hear you. But uh, anyway, Frank Buffalo Hyde, welcome to Art of the City. I'm so glad I've been chasing you around because you're so popular and you're a hard guy to get on camera here. Sorry about that. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's okay. So you were living in, were you in Albuquerque and then you moved? Um, I, we were living in Santa Fe. Okay. Uh, moved back there about 10 years ago. Uh, I was actually born in Santa Fe uh, at the old Indian Hospital. And I grew up equally in Santa Fe and equally on the Onondaga uh, Reservation in Syracuse, New York. I'm Onondaga Beaver Clan in Nez Perce. Okay. So how did you end up from Syracuse to um, Santa Fe? Well, you know, it's the same story as a lot of people uh, in Indian country. Uh, the Institute of American Indian Arts. My mother was studying there. Uh, my father was studying there. So they met and, you know, as they say, the rest is history. Um, my aunts and uncles also went there and um, two of my sisters attended the Institute of American Indian Arts as well. So you come from like a very long lineage of artists then? Um, yeah, we have, I have art on both sides of my family. My mother was a modern dance major. My father uh, started out as a painter, but then uh, evolved into a sculptor. And uh, my uncles all are artists or musicians as well. So yeah. And who's your dad? Uh, Doug Hyde. Okay, I know your dad. I actually yeah, I, I interviewed him. You know, your dad did the sculpture for my tribe, uh, Rincon Band of Luceno Indians here in San Diego. And he did an absolutely incredible sculpture of one of our basket makers. And as you entered the casino, I don't know if you've seen it. It's a woman, she's holding baskets over her head. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, have yep. you seen it? Okay, so I, I, when we installed that piece, I took your dad aside over at the brewery that we had just opened and I said, hey, Doug, let me do a little interview. So, wow, that's so great. I love your dad, by the way. He's just an amazing man. Yeah, you know, I grew up working uh, in his studio. Uh, all of us did, you know, from the time that we were like eight or nine, uh, we would be his little helpers in the studio and in the office. So did you... You grew up around art, but when did you decide that you were going to um, commit your life to this journey of becoming an artist? Um, you know, I, I resisted being an artist, air quote artist, um, for a long time. I figured there was enough artists in our family that I would, I would go with something safer. So I decided I was going to be a rock and roll star. <laughs> so. I don't know if that's safer, but it's it's awesome. Oh yeah sarcastically safer yeah no i um i was a musician for a long time in syracuse um in a band called no good reason and we started out on an open mic night and we ended up um opening up for regional traveling national acts in syracuse from the time i was like 15 to like 19 18. okay yeah what do you play 
Uh, I play guitar and sing. I'm a songwriter. Right. Are you yeah. still doing that along with your art? There? Yeah. Well, I do. I, I mean, I have the stuff. I've got a bunch of guitars and um, keyboards and stuff like that. And my daughter is starting to get interested in that. So I don't do it as much as I'd like to. But um, yeah, I mean, once a musician, always a musician. And, and uh, painting is very similar. Composition, you know, making, uh, making different elements come together. Yeah, I've always said that um, painting is to the eyes what music is to the ears. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's definitely using all the same skills, but um, one of the things I really liked about um, being an artist, fine artist, painter, whatever you call it, is that um, whatever happens is up to you. You don't have to rely on anyone else, like not showing up for band practice or uh, not making it to performances or whatever drama they have in their lives. So, um, you know, I started, you know, I do a lot of different things. Like I went to school for creative writing. I have, I am an art writer. I've been, I wrote for catalogs for the Peabody Essex Museum and the uh, Tacoma Art Museum. And uh, so I think I concentrated on painting for the better part of 20 years to try to, you know, get better at it. Cause I ultimately that's, that's the goal I feel as an artist is to always improve and, and refine your process. Yeah, I think you're right about that for sure. So let's talk a little bit. So you just moved, now you're you are living with your family and you guys mm -hmm. moved, what, two months ago? Yeah, we've, we've newly re relocated to Minnesota. And why Minnesota? And it's, uh, uh, my wife is a art professor and she accepted a position here. Wow, that's such, I love to hear that, you know, I love your roots where you came from. And then I love to hear that, you know, your, your wife is in art and your whole family has been around art because I, my mom is an artist as well. I didn't take the route of art, although kind of like your mom, I did dance and my mother also um, did modern dance growing up. So she danced, um, she did like, you know these names because of your mom, but you know, Alvin Ailey and Mark mm -hmm. Graham and a lot of those, um, I don't know how old you are, but those were kind of the influences that I grew up in the seventies uh, with going to all these dance performances. And then she was also a painter. So I followed in the footsteps of being an art dealer. So I've worked with lots of artists over a really long time. And I think that art is so important, but I'm really impressed when there's a family that everybody's involved in it because I think that you're, it's almost that DNA that you know, you're building upon. And then your kids, you'll see what comes next because I've been following your work and you've got some really interesting, it's not just the art itself, which is great, but it's your ideas behind the art. So I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about your commentary there. Thanks, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, well, as you know, art is not for everyone. Being an artist is not for everyone. It's, um, it's, it is, you know, really true what they say. It's feast or famine. A lot of times it's um, lots of long hours of hard work and, you know, there's really no vacations. There's no shortcuts to anything. And uh, I think the difference with me and what I've chose to do is that very young and very early on, I made a commitment that I was going to do it for the long haul. I, I made a commitment that this is what I do, this is what I'm going to do. And um, that's something that really discourages a lot of artists that n nothing happens in the first six months out of art school or the first year, if they're not, um, you know, if they're not successful air quotes, like whatever that means, um, they just stop. They just, you know, they don't feel like their, their effort has been rewarded with the um, appropriate amount of um, return from the universe. So I knew early on when I started, I made the commitment I was going to be doing it for the long haul and that I was going to try to get better at what I do. I mean, I, I tell people I, in school, I was not the greatest painter, although I felt like I was. I mean, I saw, I see some of the um, photos of my early pieces and then they're just awful. Uh, but at the time I was like, wow, like, wow. I was so impressed and taken. And uh, that's how I started spending more time in the painting studios in school. 
and stopped and I stopped um, turning in my writing assignments. And then um, not too long after that, I decided I was going to be a, an, an artist. And uh, I took a look around at what was out there and I really didn't see anything that represented my uh, experience as a indigenous person at the beginning of the you know 21st century. So I kind of set out looking for that. I found it in a couple artists' work, but you know, not a lot of people were dealing with contemporary reality, contemporary native issues um, 20, 25 years ago. And uh, so that was the seed that, that started all of the growth and everything that I've been pushing for. Um, stylistically, I've been all over the map. I've uh, sort of investigated every art form and every art style that I liked and was drawn to. And uh, I did the work. Um, so most of my work is um, content orientated. It's not just um, composition orientated. In other words, that there's, there's something there. A lot of times they're allegorical. Uh, there's a message there that's um, conversation starter. I, I'd like to get people to slow down and think about things and look at things and maybe say, you know, something to someone else about it. And, yeah, I think your work's a little controversial sometimes. I'll look at a piece and just like you said, I'll look at it and then I have to look at it again. Because I'll follow, I follow you on the um, social media feeds. But what I really like is I like how you, you still have the hint to the traditions of who we are as um, you know Native people, Indigenous people but then also you're bringing in contemporary and you're also bringing in a little bit of a sarcasm, which I personally like, in my opinion, that's my read on it, is that there's a, sometimes there's a little bit of a tongue in cheek in some of it that I've seen. And also, you know, definitely a little bit um, in your face commentary about some very important issues. And I think, I can't remember the last thing I saw you post, but I thought it was really interesting. I don't know if you have anything there that you're working on that maybe you can share or just your ideas about what you're showing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always working on something. I, I try to have at least six or 10 or 12 pieces going at a time, different sizes and mediums. Um, I think it's important to always be working on something, whether it's, if I can't be in the studio, I'll always be thinking about ideas and editing my ideas and writing notes on my phone. Um, I realized recently that I come, that I'm part of a long tradition called satire, uh, satirical paintings. Um, it used to bother me because I thought, you know, people were laughing at my paintings and then I was like, can someone take art seriously that they laugh at that makes them laugh? And for a couple of years, it was a, it was a tough pill for me to swallow, but um, that reaction really is powerful. If you can make somebody react by an idea that you've had and that you've redispersed and reconfigured and put out on a two-dimensional um, plane and then have them look at it and then engage with it and then react to it. I mean, if you think about it, it's pretty powerful. And not a lot of, not a lot of things do that. Not a lot of people can do that consciously. So, so true. So, true. Um, so I try to, I'm very careful about what I put out in the world. Um, any imagery that I use that's uh, indigenous, I never use cere ceremonial imagery. I don't divulge any sort of cultural knowledge. Um, I use every, anything that's out there and then that's public. Mm -hmm. And um, use it in a way to um, get people to think about their ideas of what Native Americans are and what indigenous reality is today. And um, it started out, you know, for in all the literature and movies and, and music that natives lived in two worlds, but that's not true any longer. We live in multiple realities. Um, we're, we're existing on every um, plane we're at the vanguard of everything, um, music, writing, uh, law, uh, art, of course. And I think, you know, we're at, we're at a good point in indigenous history. 
I, I'm not going to go as far as to say it's a renaissance, but we're at an exciting time where people are owning their own stories and uh, they're not waiting to be discovered and they're not waiting for Hollywood to come and um, tell them what their stories are. We're just, we're just out there doing our, doing our thing. And uh, I think the social media and the internet has really accelerated the uh, conversation between the artist and the, and the public. I mean, I have access to people immediately um, as much as I want, as much as they want. When you were growing up, you know, did you, were you surrounded by um, your native, your indigenous community, or were you, you know, in a white world, if you will, for better, lack of better terms? I spent the school year um, on the Onondaga Nation around my family and friends. Um, and I went to the high school that was off the reservation, the middle school and high school. So I would say both. Okay. Um, definitely family and friends in Central New York, they all know me as Buffalo um, Buff. And um, it is my actual name. If anyone's curious, Frank Buffalo Hyde is um, my given name. I'm named after Nez Perce people, Frank Henry and Mary Buffalo. And a lot of people think that's a, that's a pen name, stage name. And uh, I always tell them, if I was going to make a name up, I would make one up uh, better than that. <laughs> it's pretty good, though. I, I don't it is. I mean, I, my, my dad told me what my native name was, but now I can't remember. So that goes to show you how our culture has gotten lost over the years. But um, I, I yeah. have a similar existence. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, probably even less than you because I didn't, I, I visited the reservation, but my parents got divorced at a, a young age. So I really didn't feel like I fit in at all. I didn't even really, you know, everybody thought I was Mexican, which is fine, but I wasn't. So I think when you do start to delve into who you are as an indigenous person, there is a sense of belonging that someone who hasn't experienced that would understand because I, my belief is is that I think we have this DNA that is uh, very rich within us because we are still standing on the ground that our relatives, our ancestors, this is our continent. And so there's this energy force that's still on this land, whether it was taken and whether we have been almost not we haven't been assimilated I mean almost we were but we haven't been and so I think that knowing who we are and then an artist like you which is what I wanted to bring up you're almost painting a picture of telling the story of who we are which has been lost and um, I think that that's what is so profound about your work is that it's modern but it still harkens back to those really those roots of who you are and who I am as an indigenous person. Yeah, I mean, it, um, it's a conversation I have very, very often with other indigenous artists and um, people that are trying to do anything for um, indigenous causes. It's, um, my work isn't necessarily geared towards collectors. My work isn't really geared towards the market um, I've sort of been able to bend the market to my work instead of the other way around. And that's part of my stubbornness or maybe my, uh, my naiveness at, at, at the, when I started doing this, that I, that, uh, I could do that. And, um, so I think I make, I make work for indigenous people and I don't necessarily paint things how they are. I paint them how I would like them to be, how I, I see them how they could be um and i think that's that's great i mean that's part of um that's part of how i use my talent um as a weapon people think that you know weaponized things are, are bad all the time but you know weapons get your attention weapons cut to the point weapons get you to um do something. So, uh, yeah, I mean, my, my work, 
definitely I have to be entertained first and foremost. It's like if I'm not getting anything out of it, then anybody else will, won't either. So I constantly, like I said, I'm trying to improve on the themes that I've already sort of established. So what um, are was, some of the themes that you, what are some of the things that are important to you in your work when you're creating? Uh, as a you know, as an artist, that I was when I was first starting out, I thought I had to reinvent the wheel every time. Mm -hmm. You know, an artist, a young artist, wants to like invent something that's brand new. They want to, they want to reinvent the wheel, and they want to be heralded for it. And after doing it a while, I, I started realizing that I've come up with some pretty interesting concepts that I could go back and start um, investigating instead of beating myself up, trying to make something new all the time, always pushing forward. And that's fine. And I still, you know, I still set um, time aside in each show that I have ex exhibition, whether it's at a museum or a, a, a gallery, or um, I always set aside a few pieces where I push myself and, and get out of my own way and see see what happens. So I think it's a, it's a push-pull uh, you know, combination of going with an established idea and then building on it, making it better. Um, a lot of the themes in my work are um, sort of built around appropriation, cultural identity, um, the conversation between the popular culture and how it portrays indigenous people for advertisement. It seems like when, when any, whenever they get like stuck for an idea, they always go right back to native people. It's like, uh, we, well, we've, you know, we're trying to sell tires. What, what, what can we get to sell tires? And, oh, I got it. Let's do a Buffalo. And so once they go, once they start down that road, you know, it'll be a Buffalo that has a headdress on or something weird. And um, it seems, seems like it's the, uh, it's the easy out for advertisers, but a lot of them are just trampling, pulling stuff from cultures that, um, you know, I think uh, without, without the responsibility to those communities or without the um, knowledge that they're doing some, they're doing harm to the representation of those people. And I think, um, I, think it's just I used to be- For so long that it's just so, um, really about yeah, well, I, I think that voice and we're saying um, pretty much not cool. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, it's like we went through a generation where everybody was like hyper aware of that cultural sensitivity, like the 90s, the 80s and 90s. People were like, people recognized that. And then somewhere in the last 20 years, like, there was a whole generation that thought that since we dealt with that issue, we don't have to deal with it anymore. And they just it kind of at all the progress we made kind of just went back and um, they don't realize that it's real. These are real people. These are real cultures. Do you have icons then? Do you have any iconic imagery that you like to go back to that, you know, that people would look and say, oh, I know that's um, Frank Buffalo Hyde's work um, because I've seen him use that imagery or those um, maybe themes? Yeah, I mean, that's, when you when you create your visual, your own visual vocabulary, that's when you, um, that's when you know you're, out, you're onto something. I've had people yeah. tell me that they can look at a painting across the room and know that it's mine. Yes. Um, I never really saw that in my own work, but I guess there are certain themes that I've uh, for a long time, I resisted painting buffaloes because it's my name and it was too easy. And like everybody was, you know, everybody paints buffaloes that's native. But uh, until I found a way, uh, a concept that would justify me doing it, I, I didn't do it. And now I have a series um, called the Buffalo Field Series. And they, that, that kind of evolved into the contact um, series where the buffaloes are being chased by UFOs. Um, and then that that evolves into the Buffalo Burger series, where there's uh, there's Buffalo Burgers. Um, so it's like um, I like to pride myself on making paintings that 
nobody else would. And that's, that you know, you that's good or bad. There? Is that the Buffalo burger? Uh, this one is, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a couple of those. And I do, I love what you say, and I'm going to steal it. I love the idea of creating a visual vocabulary. I, you're the first person that's ever said that. And it's a pro profound thought, because it is true. I always call it the helicopter test. You know, I say, if you could fly a helicopter over, you have some paintings on the ground there and you can fly over and you can look down and immediately recognize, oh, you know, that's your work or that's a Warhol or it's a Monet or whatever. There's that, like you said, it's a um, visual vocabulary that an artist has been able to establish. And I think that's the hardest part of an artist's work is to find something that's that unique, that's profoundly just yours. Uh, as an artist, that's a whole a life's journey to figure that out. And it, it is, and for, I'm sorry, um, it is, and it's like, there's two things that are really tough for an artist. Number one, it's to not fall into the trap that you create for yourself, which is part of the visual vocabulary. So let's say, um, you, you make a painting and it's, everybody likes it. So everybody wants you to keep making that painting over and over. And some artists find that and do that and it's fine. And that's all they want out of art. And it's, that's enough for them. It's, it, it's not for me. Um, I always had a, had a problem with uh, staying interested in a subject. So um, for me, I pushed myself to make what you're recognizing is how I make the paintings. So I can I can switch my site to different subject matters and it doesn't, no matter what I'm painting, how I paint it is what you're recognizing, not exactly what I'm painting. So okay. that's kind of what I'm, what I'm doing. So now like I have, uh, I have a series called Zombie Nation um, and it's, uh, there were like uh, zombies sort of walking across Western scenes like teepees, picturesque clouds. And I just recently finished a study called Zombie Nation, We the People. It's on my Instagram page and it's uh, zombies walking to the foreground towards the viewer in front of the Capitol building. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, that yeah. Says it all. yeah. So it's um, a lot of my work has been connected to current events and um but lately i've been trying to be less reactionary and more like making the art world and popular culture react to me instead of me always reacting to it and uh so it's you know that's what i'm into and i've had some pretty decent response from doing that i mean people really for whatever reason with my work really respond to me sort of pushing the buttons instead of reacting to my buttons being pushed. Well, so you're being true to yourself. And I think that that's what I see in your work. And I, and I do really appreciate that you're being a little provocative. And I think that's important. I think that's one thing that I love about art is that it does create a reaction, positive or negative, as long as it is one and you know as an artist you, you're doing something. Otherwise, it's just, it's boring. And, you know, then- it Yeah, I, I call anything, it. Anything, right? Then- For sure. You need to see it at Home Goods in the decorative corner. <laughs> <laughs> Man, every time I go there, I'm like, look, it's fine art. <laughs> I know, well, well, my mom is so funny because we'll go there, I don't know, whatever, for sheets or we always, go in the art section because she's an artist and she she's very funny she always finds a piece she's like I should take this home and then add this and that to it and actually fix it <laughs> yeah then put it back and raise the price that's it so what I have a question so how old are your kids I have one child she just turned 10 okay, my daughter so what does your 10 year old think about your work because I have a 13 year old and I always find it interesting, that generation, which they're on a different wavelength than we are, even as indigenous people in their own right, what are her thoughts on your art? What does she think about it? 
well, I'm going to say her full name because if I don't, she'll be very upset. Uh, Niepa Wota Home and Hyde is my daughter. Uh, she's just turned 10 and she's a way better painter than I'll ever be. Um, she doesn't, she doesn't have the hangups of being indigenous. So she's been painting since the time she could basically roll out of her diaper. Um, she's been making work and some, she's made some really beautiful, amazing paintings and she's, she sold them. I mean, we had a, we had a studio that was open to the public in Santa Fe and she sold quite a bit of paintings there. And, uh, now she's evolved into, she has a knitting business. Um, okay. she's with a friend, she's knitting hats and scarves and, uh, she's doing pretty well with them. But as far as what she thinks about my work, I mean, it's, it's what every kid thinks about what their parents do. She laughs, she laughs at like how much people like it. She thinks it's funny. She, she, you know, she knows she's a better painter than I am. So she just laughs and uh, teases me about, oh, you're just going to drip. You just got to drip on it and then make a squiggle and you'll be done. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Sorry, I always but, uh, to hear how that next generation. And my daughter, like your daughter, she actually took after my mom. So she does paint and she has her own little painting line too. So again, I think it's so wonderful. So what are your, now you, you've been painting for, how long have you been painting professionally? Uh, I had, well. Selling your work, I'd say. I, um, well, being professional and, and selling is two, two totally different yeah. things. I, I, uh. I had my first exhibition as a high schooler. I had uh, charcoal drawings in Armory Square in Syracuse, New York when I was 18. And um, so I would say I started professionally. That was my first exhibition. And I didn't really sell much of anything. Um, for the first 10 years, nobody really cared about what I was doing. I was, I call those the woodshop years. I was just in the studio, just like making all kinds of crazy, whatever I wanted or thought was amazing and um, <clears throat> harassing galleries. I would go to galleries twice a week and ask them to take a look at my work. And, you know, some, some were nice and some were not. And a lot of them, all of them said no. Um, but I did that for years. And then you only need one yes mm -hmm. to get you on your way. And, uh, it was, a, it was a gallery that was just off of Canyon Road in Santa Fe, but um, it was close enough to Canyon Road, so I told everybody it was on Canyon Road. Sure. So I was like, I'm, I'm showing on Canyon Road. And so that was the beginning. And, um, so I, I very much, um, I very much remember that. And so I always try to, to realize that this is, you know, it's not guaranteed. I'm very fortunate that people are interested and stay interested in what I do. And that I've been very lucky that I've sort of every year I've had better sales, better representation, better museum uh, exhibition opportunities. So I don't take that stuff lightly and I'm very thankful for it. And I try not to squander that and I take that responsibility um, very seriously. Um, so, yeah, I mean. Um, so you've been in the game for a while. Your hustle is strong, which I love. Probably 25 years, probably. I started, uh, I'm, I'm going to date myself now, but I also opened my first gallery 25 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's different, but it's the same because you have to establish yourself as a gallerist and then have to learn. I mean, you don't just walk into, even as a gallerist, even though I had worked for a gallery prior to that and I'd been around art, you have to develop your own gallery and the art that you're gonna curate and then learning how to work with artists and work, learning how to work with the public and collectors. It's a, it is a, you know, you've gotta be in it to win it. And it is not necessarily a business that it can be lucrative, but you can't go into it for that reason because you'll fall out. You There's so many other things with the amount of work that it takes to run a gallery that you, if you were just in it for money, you definitely should do something else. So there's got to be more to it than that. And so for me, even like with Art of the City and looking at your work, 
I just think that art is such an important element of who we are as human beings. And I think that supporting the arts, artists like you, because it's, it's a unique thing, this one person, you, your ability to create, there's only ever gonna be you, that's it. And if we don't support what you're doing, the world, when we're gone, your work will remain, the world will miss out on who you are and what you had to say through your art and that talent. So that's been my passion, but what would you like to see in the future? I mean, you're gonna to continue to do what you're doing. Do you have any aspirations for, you know, anything, traveling with your work or seeing it in more museum shows? What are your thoughts about that? Um. I mean, my work's pretty well known in in the contemporary native art world, yes. um, and it's I consciously didn't put my face out in front of my work for like fifteen years. Um, only after my daughter was born that I started like letting people see who I am, who who makes this work. Okay. And, but for years and years, I stressed that only show pictures of my art. People would ask for headshots or ask to take my portrait, and I'm like. I'm not, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not making paintings to like sell shampoo or jewelry. I'm, this is what, I take this very seriously. I want people to know me for my work. So when people, I mean, a lot of people still don't really know what I look like, but um, I, would, I was able to go to my own shows and like listen to what people were saying because they didn't know I, I, it was me. And so it was really fun and really sad at the same time because people are just brutal. <laughs> People are really brutal, especially if they don't know that you're the one, you're the one that made it. So, um, so honestly, um, being well known. Uh, what my my point was, I'm I never wanted to be a big fish in a little pond. I always have my eye on the next thing. I want to be um, in the national conversation for painting for indigenous artists, but not just that for artists. Period. Um, and internationally, I've you know I've traveled quite a bit internationally with for my work. And I'm very fortunate for that. So more of that when we can, can travel. And um, I'm I have a traveling solo museum exhibition that's currently at the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa. And um, I'm getting ready to start on a very large solo exhibition for a museum that's been in the news lately that I can't talk about yet, but. Um, in the next couple of years, um, you'll see that, and it's um, it'll be you know it'll be one of the one of my circles closing and culmination of you know twenty five something years working towards um, that. And uh, but honestly, I just want to keep um, expanding what that you know what people think art is, and more and more. Um, People are always saying, you know, is it, do you like being called an indigenous artist or are you just an artist? It's like, I can't separate how I was raised and the way that I think from what I make. Um, but also that's not all that I am. I mean, um, I always tell the story about how Cy Twombly probably never got asked um, by an art writer if his great grandfather showed him how to make a scribble like that, or is that a, is that a, a family, um, is that a family scribble? I mean, did your great grandfather, you know, tell teach your grandfather, and then you learned how to do that? And so, that's just the responsibility and, and a narrative that's not put on non-indigenous artists. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I love that's that. Kind of, I, I understand yeah. exactly what you're saying about that, and I do think that there, that you know, there is kind of a fine line there between oh, you're indigenous artists, so you know. You have some special thing you know, that you bring to the world, opposed to just being a talented artist. And I mm -hmm. see what you're saying, but within that too, I also think that that's part of your your thumbprint, if you will, of who you are, your uniqueness, and the fact that you, as an indigenous person, I appreciate that you're taking the culture and you're you're bringing it up, you know, to for people to have maybe a different view on what it means to be indigenous. So to me, 
I think that is really, really needed um, just so that people can see the flavor of who we are because um, the way that it's been represented is not accurate. And so now you're bringing it into a whole new realm because you're bl blending some of the old traditions and the new, but ultimately it's you. It's not any of that. It, that's just part of the who you are, but that isn't who you are. You are your own unique person creating your own unique statements as an artist solely standing upon that. So I think it's great. And I've really enjoyed talking to you. You're an amazing artist. And I'm, I'm glad I was able to finally um, get a moment because I know you've been really busy. And um, Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. No, yeah, it's, um... it's, uh, it's well worth the wait because you've had so many great things to say. And I know that uh, people watching, they're going to love you know, hearing this, but also I think artists that are going to watch this are going to be very inspired because you have some very deep thoughts about the importance of what you're creating. So, so. yeah, thank you. So if people yeah. want to follow you, what's the best way for them to keep an eye on what you have coming up, especially this new museum show? Um, the museum show is at least a couple years out and um, I would say that Instagram and Facebook are probably the most immediate ways to see what I'm up to. Um, I'm always promoting um, new, new things that I'm making and projects I'm involved with. So it's just um, my full name, Frank Buffalo Hyde, at Frank Buffalo Hyde on Instagram, uh, username, same on Facebook, um, as well as on Twitter. I don't use Twitter that much. Um, but yeah, those are the those are the most immediate ways to see what I'm working on. And I try to post funny things and sometimes a little off color things as well, just to keep it interesting. So I love so. it. I'm a little irreverent myself. So I think irreverence is a good thing. It keeps everybody on, on their toes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. The bad thing is that my mom follows me and every once in a while I'll get a text. I'll get a text like, Hey, are you, what are you doing? And I'm just like, my mom's an old hippie, so she's probably more irreverent than I am. So it works out. Well, thank you yeah. so much for having this interview on Art of the City, Frank. I really appreciate you taking the time. And we just want to keep supporting, the, supporting you as an artist. And I hope that all of the people watching are able to really see your talent. When I put this up, I'm going to show some of your work so people get a little bit of a point of reference. You can send me what you'd like. But okay. I'm looking forward to following you. And I'm looking forward to maybe at some point, um, maybe we could do an exhibit at my gallery um, here. I'm building a gallery out on my Indian reservation. It's going to be devoted to Native art. So I'd love okay. to you out there. Yeah, I'm always yeah. looking for new opportunities. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Great. Well, thank you, my friend. Um, blessings to you and your family. And thank you thank so you. much for being on Art of the City. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today, Art of the City TV. That was Frank Buffalo Hyde. We are really thrilled that he was able to come on the show. And we want to invite you again to come on live next Wednesday. We'll have yet another Indigenous artist coming on. So thank you for joining me today, Art of the City TV, live streaming here from Facebook. We'll see you next Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time.